Hi, everybody. Um, I've got about seven minutes to summarize global sustainable consumption and production. So as you can imagine, I'm going to be taking a few random themes and putting them together. Um, some good news and bad news across both, really, uh, to give an overview. So firstly, uh, in terms of bad news, uh, I'm suspending the, the, the disbelief that you can somehow separate consumption and production at this point, so bear with me. But as producers, um, business tending to be the key way in which we utilize resources um, for production. Um, if you imagine businesses in the center of this graph, what you often uh, see, uh, what, we, what I see all the time, what we observe, are a huge range of impacts that, that, that result from production, but then also then come back and impact businesses in different ways. Um, and so this, uh, and what we often feel are, are the sort of the crime, migration, energy insecurity, wealth disparities. And then on the outside edge, you have these really systemic, fundamental, environmental and social issues um, that, um, that affect business and that business affect through the production um, that it uh, ways in which it produces. And all every time I look at the data, the data on all of these outside effects and inner effects are all going in the wrong direction. Um, there are lots of positive uh, aspects. I'm going to cover some of those today. But in general, we're not seeing uh, particularly good trends. And I show this, uh, this sort of graph a lot to my students. And the reason I do that is because um, we have to focus on climate change. It is critical. However, um, if we had zero carbon energy tomorrow, and therefore climate change and ocean acidification, as well as the interconnected effects of that, was somehow resolved, we would still be left with a whole host of unsustainability issues um, around topsoil erosion, biodiversity loss, water stress, all kinds of things that come from how we use the energy, not um, what type of energy that we are using. So we have to um, think about those two things um, when we're thinking about uh, production. So moving on to a more local uh, level in terms of uh, businesses uh, specifically and production, what we're starting to see is the impact of these things going in uh, the wrong direction are, for example, um, the availability of resources and uh, the kind of continuing pressure on those stocks. So this is a sort of a stock check. Um, sorry, I thought it might be a little bit clearer, but uh, you can, uh, and I think these slides will be going up, but you can see the years left of certain resources. And we're talking in the sort of, you know, sort of eight years, 12 years, 17 years of some um, really significant resources like silver and copper if we continue using those resources at the same rate. And what that means for business and um, producers in general is a fluctuation and an uncertainty as much as anything else. Um, so uh, very difficult to negotiate contracts, very difficult to understand what, what tomorrow brings. And we've, I've got examples of businesses who literally have millions of pounds of unrecovered debt within two years because they only predicted an increase of 20 odd percent in their raw material um, prices rather than the 30 odd percent that actually happened within one year. And so that sort of environment is, is becoming increasingly difficult. But what it is doing is driving business to understand that actually, as, as, as is often said, incremental change is not enough. It has to be transformational. And we are st starting to see, on, um, on the positive note, much more understanding of this. Whether you call it circular economy, cradle to cradle, um, a uh, number of different, uh, nature inspired by, uh, business inspired by, inspired by nature. We're starting to see that we, we can't continue on this linear uh, take, make, waste. We have to change what we're doing. And that also includes separating biological and technical resources so that you reduce also toxins in the environment, etc., etc. So we are starting to see that. And here are a few stats um, that, that just kind of give you an inkling of where we're going on some of this. Um, so this is uh, 2013 steel packaging recycling. It's one element, but you can see we're at about 75% average across Europe. You know, those those sorts of figures give me hope, you know, that's, that's really quite good. Um, and then looking more globally, you've got here, the, the uh, China uh, last year announced a 500 million, um, sorry, the Chinese, Chinese circular economy law has been in, in, in uh, force for a number of years and uh, as, as having great effect. There's a chart here showing some really good increases and being measured, how do we change to a circular economy? And uh, the EU, uh, which of course we're not going to benefit from anymore. Uh, 500 million um, 
um, pounds worth of circular economy funding going forward. Um, so in terms of uh, consumption, moving on to consumption, the other side, you can see the, these are a number of um, uh, resources and the increase in our consumption levels, construction materials, biomass, for example, everywhere you look. Down here's an interesting piece of research that shows it's not just that our consumption is increasing, but when you're looking at sort of the lifestyle habits and the social impacts of what we're consuming, this is the correlation between tobacco, alcohol, soft drinks, and uh, processed foods. And you can see they, they're very correlated, which showing this is a whole lifestyles in terms of how we consume that's unsustainable, both environmentally and socially. Um, we've got a fan, uh, great to see a, a paper on the circular economy coming later um, and about what's been happening in Bristol and encouraging more going on here. However, I was a bit depressed because only about 10 years ago we had a very vibrant national industrial symbiosis project, um, which is still going, but the funding has been cut. And, and actually that's left a space where now, thankfully, people are starting to come in and say, well, can't we do more in this area in terms of connecting business waste as inputs for other business? So, um, so in terms of uh, also a little bit more bad news, it's also to do with who's consuming. So this is not just about how much we're consuming and what we're consuming, but who is it? And this just outlines that essentially the world's wealth um, is highly concentrated and that it is the people who have the wealth that are disproportionately consuming, which is what we know, 10% uh, consuming almost 60% of the world's resources. So this, is, this matters in terms of in inequality. So the good news in sustainable consumption, however, is that we are, um, we are moving somewhere. Companies are starting to recognise that you cannot go, we can't go on like this. Um, that uh, essentially you can't move beyond a certain place within your business model to a transformational place unless you work with your customers and co-create that journey with them. This, this is the cutting edge of where companies are starting to, to think. Um, I work, for example, on research in business purpose, purpose beyond profit of mainstream businesses. And although there are only a handful of you know, very good examples of companies saying actually profit is not the focus of what we do, even though we are a public limited company, um, what it's showing is the direction and the maturity to a much more mature, sustainable world. Um, I don't know how I'm doing on, on time, because, uh, to, to, all right, okay. Um, so, um, and I saw a, a, a fantastic, uh, so brilliant examples of companies starting to get it day by day. Yesterday, I saw that Unilever had finally realised that it has a massive impact on our brain print and has done a survey of the gender inequalities across its advertising and has decided that it is going to fundamentally alter at that at that very micro, symbolic level of how it represents our cultures, who we are and who we should be. That's what I've been working on for the last almost 20 years and it's so wonderful to see companies starting to talk like that. Because when companies start to talk like that, that's where we're going next and I'm convinced of that. So just the last slide, some really good news as well in terms of what consumers are looking for. And this just shows the increased trends. You can see these are, these are over, over the years from 2008 to 2012, you can see a considerable increase in the people who would recommend a company based on the fact that they're trying to do good while make money. Um, they would promote it and they would switch to those companies. And business is starting to look at this information and change what they do because they understand that it counts. So I am an optimist, it's true, but nonetheless, I can see some fantastic things happening. And very particularly what I can see happening in our local area um, is um, many fantastic things, including what's happening at Langage Farm. I'm going to pass over to Paul Winterton, who's going to give us some specific details about the fantastic changes in consumption and production happening on our doorstep. So, thank you, Paul. Good morning. Sustainability, what does it mean for our business in the private sector? Well, it does have to be profitable, it does have to be manageable, and it does have to be cost-effective. Our inherent success from 1980 was our legacy was producing high-quality, high-end dairy products. This success drove us to look at the procurement of our milk. So we had to look at our farming practices to make sure we had that sustainable flow of milk coming through to support the growth within the business. After some 
our analysis, we discovered that our yielding from our herd and grass, grass production was about 15% below where it needed to be. Likewise with that of a stunted maize growth. Now, the reason for this was compaction of the soil. So the worm colonies were not actually doing their job. What did that look like and what did that mean for us from a commercial perspective? Probably somewhere, I'll come on to the figures in a second actually, and, and, and I'll, I'll make the link. We discovered basically that we had more cows than the land would naturally contain. Spreading food waste, so, sorry, spreading water and uh, slurry across the ground was actually doing us no favours at all. By re-evaluating this and looking at anaerobic digestion, we then realised that we could divert the water and the slurry that we was putting on to the fields back into the AD plant. As a direct consequence of that, the CODs, chemical oxygen, biological oxygen demand, increased and the worm colonies created their normal natural environment. And grass yield was back up to 100%. Now, what does that mean from a financial point of view? For us, it was quite alarming. Representing bottom line figures, we're talking a figure of between 60 to 80,000 pounds on milk that we didn't have to buy in from neighbouring farms, which was a huge saving to the business. So as a result of something which was a problem for our business, we actually found a solution through probing and education. And I have to admit, the educational aspect of our business was a bit wanting in the respect of, of that particular issue. We now have an expert on site who's probably the UK expert, and a gentleman called Gary Jones, who actually talks about anaerobic digestion as a specific subject. The plant that we have could probably handle all the food waste in its entirety from our lovely city of Plymouth. Looking at the marketing elements of this, we then realised, because I'm not no marketeer, we then realised that we had a unique situation within the business and what we determined and classed as the only sustainable food loop, true sustainable food loop within the dairy industry. And what does that look like? It looks like a farm, an anaerobic digesting plant and a manufacturing facility all within the same footprint of that particular area. So we could offer our customers a unique experience when enjoying their food. The quality aspect of our food has never been in question. The quality within our business, it has no finish line. And I know you've heard that cliche before, but it's absolutely critical within our business. So the unique food loop works as such. We manufacture products within the dairy. We sell them to you as customers. You enjoy them. And any food waste there and after comes back to us by a private independent haulier business. It then gets fed back into the anaerobic digester facility. It creates methane gas as a result of that process. We then put that through turbines to create electricity. That electricity goes back to the factory, goes back to the farm, goes back to the AD plant to run our facilities. The byproduct from that is a, is a product called it's a biofertilizer, a digestate. We then put that back onto the fields, and the cows eat that. Sorry, it grows the grass uh, you know, to, to the 100% yield that we're looking at. The cows eat that, enjoy it, increase the milk yield, and then the whole cycle begins again. So the science behind this is absolutely incredible. And please come and visit the factory and have a look at that. Part of our educational process is working with the university. For many, many years within our business, we have a fantastic group of people that work with us. We have a good staff retention. 
But one of the things within our business which I recognised as being problematic was the education and understanding the science about what we do. The AD plan typifies this because out of a problem, we come up with a solution. And then we educated our staff to make sure that we understood the science behind what was going on. Manufacturing of dairy products is no different. And we've been working with the university on subjects such as the, the, the Knowledge Transfer Partnership. And I'm stood here today after meetings with various uh, members of the university. And I see those people now as friends or an extension of our business rather than experts that we, we talked about earlier on. For people to succeed, they need to feel comfortable about what they do. Education is a key part of that. And the university facility that we've had has been exceptional in delivering that. We have one particular KTP graduate that's been with us for nine months. And the work that she's been doing in educating our staff on the shop floor to understand the science behind dairy products in its manufacture has been absolutely incredible. How this is, results in success. Recently, I took the individual to Birmingham with me to present to a supermarket talking about a specific contract, which is probably going to be worth to our business if we are successful, and we're very much there, of around about £2 million. That was a direct consequence of the work and understanding the science behind what we do with the support of the university. That individual's confidence has gone from here to here. And I really want to keep that individual. She's worried. We talk about the EU, and I, I didn't really want to mention that. But I've reassured her, it doesn't matter what happens with the EU. She's a Polish young lady. And by God, we're going to keep it within our business. And just to finish, again, commercially on the bottom line, that contract develops into probably eight new jobs. OK? And I would welcome any people that want to come and work for our business, any nationality, creed, whatever country you're from, please come to our business because we want those skills. The university is a key element, and I will really encourage people within the business sector to engage with the university and work with them because their heart is huge, and out of that heart, education is the key for business success. Thank you very much.